We have analyzed your defensive capabilities as being unable to withstand us. If you defend yourselves, you will be punished. Man, you have no idea how much I miss that music. Ah, it's good to be back with the Borg. Before I get started, first of all, I want to get a hefty shout out to my latest patron supporter, Skull666. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate your support. Like always, I couldn't be here if it wasn't for folks like you helping out the channel. And again, just thank you, man. I, I can't say it enough. But... We got a lot to talk about here, and so unfortunately this is going to probably be a couple of parts for part one here of Descent, but we're going to get right into this. Back to the board. Now, this has, of course, been a long, long time coming, and I'm really glad to be working on my Star Trek video com commentary, and... This video has been blocked by CBS. Mother f***ing... Okay, okay, all kidding aside, I'm going to try not to piss off the folks at CBS that are sadly unable, apparently, to comprehend the concept of fair use, unlike Disney. So please forgive me as I will be using minimal video clips throughout these reviews because CBS is much less forgiving than the Disney Corporation, which you wouldn't think that, but hey, whatever. With all that said, let's get into Descent part one. When we last saw the Borg, they went from being the scariest villain in the history of Trek to the cute and cuddly with big chubby cheeks. Hugh. <sighs> but fortunately, this episode is not about the cute, cuddly porg, uh, Borg. It is about the evil, scary Borg. Yay, I guess, until we realize what's really going on. Our episode opens up with Data on the holodeck playing poker with Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, and Stephen Hawking, who played himself at his own request. Really? I mean, what's the deal? I dream about Star Trek ever since I was a child back in the early 1970s, and I had to wait until I was 47 years old and then pay money to meet William Shatner for five freaking minutes. But Stephen Hawking can just wheel himself onto the set and demand a part, and they give it to him. Man, I tell you, what is the deal with disabled privilege? I mean, this has just gone too far. I can't... Um, so, uh, I, I guess it would have been a good idea if my research staff, uh, let me know that, first of all, I guess, um, disabled privilege is not really a thing, and second, and boy, this is kind of embarrassing, but I guess Professor Hawking is, uh, dead, so, uh, sorry? This scene while amusing, exposes a major flaw with the episode and Star Trek The Next Generation as a whole. Data is attempting to learn more about human behavior using the holodeck. Later, he will get to experience some real emotion, which he will try to replicate again on the holodeck. And while Data is supposedly incredibly intelligent, he never stops to think that his own positronic brain is more advanced than the ship's computer, and yet the ship's computer can easily simulate our three scientists and their various emotions. Hawking is a wise guy, Einstein's fun-loving, and Newton is a stick in the mud. Data could calculate exactly how they would behave using his positronic brain. Based on the technology level, Data should have no problem understanding and even replicating emotions. He may not feel them, which could be the larger part of his arc, but the idea that he cannot understand them is frankly silly. He should also, based on the abilities that he has demonstrated, be able to analyze what the source of those emotions were when he does get them. But Data is one of those characters that is just too powerful for his own good and is frequently written into a corner. So we just have to pretend that he is inept when it comes to the basic understanding of human behavior in order to create drama. 
which there really shouldn't be any. Anyway, Riker calls red alert and data ends the program. And we get our title card as the Enterprise warps through space and... What? Wait, what? Um... Why, why, why do we have the title card before the credits? Look, I know I've been away from Star Trek for a while doing this whole Last Jedi bit, but I seem to recall that the title card would always appear after the credits. But then perhaps that is a perfectly good explanation as to what happens to the Borg in this episode. Change for change's sake. Not change to improve, just change. Riker fills in Picard that they've received a distress call while the guest star credits roll. Okay, this is just weird. I, why, why are we seeing this? I, I, I really don't get it. Did Ryan Johnson just direct this episode? Are they just trying to subvert my expectations? <sighs> anyway, Riker fills in Picard that an outpost is under attack and they rush to the scene to find um, this. <sighs> I, I, I know they want to do something we've not seen before, but this is about the dumbest looking spaceship I've ever seen. And I just finished looking at all the crap from The Last Jedi. And before you start saying, But wait, you're just complaining because it doesn't have an aerodynamic shape to it, which of course in space would not matter. <laughs> well, that's true, but what would matter in space is that the ship have a symmetrical design. With a bizarre shape like this ship, you would be wasting valuable computer power just trying to calculate how to fire all the various thrusters on the ship just to make the stupid thing go in a straight line. My theory on the design of this ship is simple. The producers of Star Trek The Next Generation were looking for a way to make the Enterprise look good. Well, mission accomplished. <sighs> So Picard and Riker discuss if the ship attacked the colony or if the ship was maybe attacked by whatever attacked the colony. And, okay, seriously, what is the deal with these credits? This is really beginning to bug me. <sighs> anyway, they, they cannot tell if someone is alive. So Riker, Worf, Data, and um, a very small woman who looks really uncomfortable being with them, which... I, I, I really don't get why she looks so nervous. I mean, after all, she's completely surrounded by main characters who... Oh, yeah, yeah, she's going to die. Hey, they beam down to the planet and... Really? Still more credits before the credits? What? <sighs> so they look around and the nervous lady tries to look at Worf and Riker's butts. And I just paused it here because I wanted everyone to make a note of this particular name in the credits. No, not Ronald D. Moore. Jerry Taylor. While it is true that Ronald D. Moore wrote this episode and carries a lot of responsibility for what happened with the Borg, this idea came from Jerry Taylor. Fuck you, Jerry Taylor. As they continue to search, they find that there is not much damage to the outpost. And credit where credit is due, a nice piece of foreshadowing by Ronald D. Moore, who hints both what is to come and at the same time gives a callback to prior Borg episodes. When Riker gives the line, they do not seem interested in the station, just the people. Which of course mirrors Q from Q Who when he explained that they are not interested in the people, only in the Enterprise. Data opens the door and finds Grandpa Borg hiding in the closet for reasons. <sighs> My only real problem with this shot is that Grandpa Borg is standing still like he's a classic Borg drone. It would have been more shocking if he had just jumped out and tackled Data the second the door opened. Now that would have been a surprise, but for him to be just standing there, he just looks like a typical Borg. And that would be fine, except that we're about to find out that that's not the behavior of the Borg anymore. So why is he behaving that way when the Borg don't behave that way? And it makes no sense. And I just... Uh... So anyway, big reveal. The Borg are back. Roll credits. Even though the credits have apparently been rolling this whole time. But whatever, Quantum. On a quick side note, a couple of people have asked me what I thought of the later season credits compared to the early season credits. Now at the time, I said I didn't really notice a difference, so I thought I would check it out. Well, the credits for this episode are just like the credits for any other episode. However, this episode was in season six. In season five, and only in season five, the credits looked like this. Doing a little digging, I found out that the season five credits were different because the 25th anniversary of Star Trek was that year. So yeah, great job celebrating the 25th anniversary by, um, 
Making a minor change to your credits. Whatever. You know what uh, you really could have done would maybe be add 25th anniversary to the bottom of the credits or something. Anyway, I just figured that since people had asked about it and a few of you want to know about it, I would dig it up and now you know. After the credits, for reasons, Grandpa Borg wakes up and suddenly starts to attack using something we have never seen before. Borg plasma guns mounted to their wrists, which seems like a really good idea. Practical, efficient, deadly. So it makes perfect sense that we would never see these weapons again after this episode. Grandpa Borg shoots at Riker, and this guy who is not Riker does a brief tumbling routine. Uh, Data kills Grandpa Borg! And suddenly a few more Borg come into the room and immediately take cover and begin shooting at Riker, who is really confused as he has never fought against an enemy that doesn't just kind of stand around out in the open before. Well, while Riker and pals are pinned down, the massive sh um, ship sh um, shoots at the Enterprise and... Um Evasive maneuvers, Ensign. Return fire. Shields down to 80%, compensating with auxiliary power. Did did somebody forget to tell LeVar Burton to wake up? Or did, did he get any coffee this day? Or was he just really, really pissed off at the director or something? I mean, that, yeah, what was that? Quantum. Back on the planet, we see that the Borg have apparently not used guns because they just suck at it. <sighs> Riker and the gang are still pinned down, and now comes the big reveal. The Borg are acting independently. And this Borg is upset because his fellow Borg was killed by Riker, and he says that he will make Riker suffer for killing his friend. Riker is obviously confused by this behavior, as I was the first time I watched this, and the second time I watched it, and the third time. And, and in fact, to this day, I really, I really don't get it. But I will get into why this makes no sense later. So this guy starts looking around the room and identifying the type of opponents he's facing. He says, biological organism Klingon, biological organism human. Notice he does not say species 8129 or whatever the Klingon designation would be. Rather, he just refers to them by their proper name, which, by the way, Locutus does the same thing in Best of Both Worlds. It's not until Voyager that the species numbering system starts, which we'll discuss that when we get to the Voyager stuff. Anyway, Nervous Lady dies. Surprise, surprise. We then get what is supposed to be the most pivotal scene of this episode. A Borg tries to um, choke Data the android because, you know, if a robot can't breathe, he'll die. Because quantum? Well, Data is, of course, worried about getting choked because quantum, and he gets very angry about it. In fact, he gets so angry that he does a full Darth Vader on him and picks him up off the ground by his neck and then throws him into the wall, killing him. Then he takes it one more step than even Vader did by grabbing him by the throat after he's dead just to make sure that he's dead. Well, just then, Expositus of Borg over there sees that Data has indeed gotten angry and does what he does best, recites what Data is, and also includes the fact that he knows Data's proper name. Ooh, it's creepy, I guess, except that none of this makes any sense. The Borg beam out, and then the big, ugly ship leaves, which... By the way, props to the effects team on this. I know that a lot of people don't understand this, but remember, this is before the days of CG spaceships. Uh, they actually had to build this thing. And while I hate the design, the sense of scale here is pretty darn good. It really does look like a huge ship that dwarfs the Enterprise-D. It just looks like a huge ship that was designed by Packlets. We are Packlets. Our ship is the Mondor. Well, the ship disappears without a trace, and that is about as good as this episode is going to get. Well, stay tuned next time when we get into a whole lot of crap. We are the Borg. Resistance is futile. You will lower your shields and click on the like button and leave a comment for the anti-tricker. If you have not before, you will hit the subscribe button and the notifications icon so that you can hear more from the anti-tricker. If you have suggestions on how to improve this channel, you will leave a comment in the comment section below. If you appreciate the work put into these videos, you will go to HTTP.
S colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash Michael J. Crawford. Link below and support this channel. Excuses are irrelevant. You will comply.